May I have your attention? What a well-behaved group. I'm Harlan Crow, and I want to say thanks to everybody for coming out tonight and being here for this debate. Uh, my job is really simple. I, I uh, want to welcome you, and I just did that. So that part's easy. I, I want to also say thanks to Jeff Rosen. Uh, Jeff runs the National Constitution Center, uh, and uh, this is the second time we've had a chance at Old Parkland to work with Jeff and his colleagues. Um, We've had a, quite a number of debates here at Old Parkland, but the very best one uh, before tonight was uh, one that Jeff organized uh, here uh, last year. So uh, I'm, I'm confident that, uh, that tonight's uh, program will be even better. Uh, Jeff, Jeff brief, just briefly, Jeff attended uh, Harvard Law and Oxford University. He's the author of six, six books, including uh, a, a new book coming out on William Howard Taft, I think in 18. There's a lot more stuff in his bio, but I'm going to skip all that and just say, Jeff, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Harlan. And thanks to you for having created this beautiful debating chamber and for bringing people together of different perspectives and for your commitment to inspiring civil dialogue here at Old Parkland and across America. The last debate we had here was indeed one of the great debates that we have hosted at the Constitution Center, but that was a tribute both to the beauty and significance of the venue and to this incredible partnership between the National Constitution Center, the Federalist Society, and the American Constitution Society. I can't tell you, ladies and gentlemen, how meaningful it is that the Constitution Center is able to bring together these two great lawyers organizations representing different perspectives on the Constitution for a series of traveling debates about the most significant issues facing America. We've now been doing this for two years. We've been from Dallas to San Francisco to Chicago two weeks ago where we debated the question of the First Amendment to Washington, to LA, and it is thrilling to see how hungry people are for civil substantive debate and how much light is cast by asking people to do what I'm going to ask you to do now, and that is to separate your political views from your constitutional views. That's, I hear a <laughs> chuckle, but I know it was an informed, uh, urbane chuckle of appreciation for the... <laughs> necessity of this crucial methodological task because this is what we're compelled to do as citizens. This is what the founding fathers had in mind when they insisted that American uh, democracy could not survive ignorant and free and that citizens had to educate themselves about constitutional principles in order for them to survive. And that was why the US Congress created the National Constitution Center with an inspiring mission to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis in order to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. What an amazing, inspiring, significant mission that was that we were given during the bicentennial of the Constitution. And we are fulfilling it with this debate tonight, and that's why I'm asking you to separate your political from your constitutional views. What does that mean in the context of today's extremely significant uh, debate, namely resolved, uh, does the First Amendment protect hate speech? It means that you might conclude that hate speech is a terrible, dreadful menace to American democracy, but that the First Amendment protects it. Or you might conclude that uh, hate speech isn't terribly significant, but the First Amendment allows uh, the government to ban it. And by making that separation, and by preparing yourself to hear the best arguments in America on both sides of this debate. I'm so thrilled that we've persuaded the debaters I'm about to introduce, nominated by the American Constitution Society and the Federalist Society to converge here, because you're about to hear the best and purest version of a debate that is at the center of American life. It is being vigorously debated on campuses. It is being vigorously debated online. And we, you need to listen very closely to these arguments so that you can make up your own minds. And that's why we're going to do something else which is important. I'm going to ask you to vote before and after the debate. And the goal of these debates is that you're going to be open-minded enough that 
will have some minds that might be changed. You might shift from one side to another. I do have to confess that we debated this question in Chicago uh, about three weeks ago, and precisely no minds were shifted as a result of the debate, <laughs> and the final vote was exactly the same as the initial one. Uh, nevertheless, a large percentage of the audience said their minds were open to the arguments on the other side, and I know that yours will be now. You need no further introduction from me except uh, logistics. Uh, here's the format. We're gonna, we're gonna vote before the arguments. Each debater will have 10 minutes to make an opening argument, followed by a five-minute rebuttal. I'll then ask them some questions for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll invite your questions on note cards. So please write them down, and I will read them with my bipartisan constitutional reading glasses, and uh, we'll have about 15 minutes more. And then we'll have closing arguments, and then we'll vote again. And the winner will be the person who changes the most minds. So please try to be as open-minded as you possibly can. Uh, silence your cell phone, please. And now it's my great honor to welcome our debaters. Shannon Gilreath is professor of law and women's gender and sexuality studies at the Wake Forest University School of Law. He teaches constitutional law, sexual identity and law, freedom of religion and gender and the law, as well as courses in, women, in the women's gender and sexuality studies department as a core faculty member and his extremely significant articles on this topic have appeared in uh, law reviews, and uh, he has recently published a wonderful op-ed in the Dallas Morning News representing his views. David French is senior writer for National Review and senior fellow at the National Review Institute. He is an attorney whose work focuses on constitutional law and the law, law of armed conflict. He's former president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, or FIRE, a former major in the U.S. Army Reserve, and his piece representing his views has also appeared in the Dallas Morning News. Please join me in welcoming our debaters. All right, it's time for our first vote. Not since Jefferson voted alone has there been such a significant vote, so think very <laughs> carefully, and I mean it. Separate your political from your constitutional views as you answer the question, do you agree with the resolution the First Amendment protects hate speech. If you agree with the resolution, use the arrow keys to highlight yes. If you're opposed, use the arrow keys to highlight no, and then hit send. Once you've hit send, your answer will be displayed back to you, which means that your response has been recorded. None, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I see attentive faces. Our votes have been recorded, and our debate will now begin. And we are going to begin with the debater in favor of the motion. The First Amendment protects hate speech. For 10 minutes, please join me in welcoming David French. Uh, first, thank you very much for hosting me. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, I've, I've worked with you on a number of debates with the National Constitution Center, and it's always an honor. The National Constitution Center puts on incredible debates. I've never had the honor of being here. This um, debate hall doesn't quite meet my normal standards for debate halls. <laughs> But the First Amendment is at stake, so no, this is a beautiful place and a fitting place to have this debate, and, and it's a fitting place to have this debate because I want to begin where our nation began, with our founding fathers. And I don't want to dive right into the text of the First Amendment, I want to dive a little bit into the philosophy and the worldview of our founding fathers. Because I think that many of, us, many of us in this hall would say our founding fathers, in spite of the fact that they were quite flawed, turned out to be relatively wise men in a number of ways. And one of the ways that these founders were wise is they recognized at the time when they were establishing our nation that they were flawed and that our nation was flawed. In fact, when our nation was founded, there were vociferous disagreements in the founding generation about some of the issues that still divide us today, the power of the federal government versus the state government, most notably about the original sin of the American founding, slavery, 
Some of the most potent and powerful issues that still divide us today divided them at that time. And so what our founders understood, they understood that they were flawed, they understood that mankind before them was flawed, and they understood that every single generation of Americans that was going to be born, live, and die under this new nation, in this new nation, was also going to be flawed. And so what did they do about that? What did they do? They established a constitution, and the constitution contained with it profound limits on the power of government, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for some of the founders. They would only ratify this constitution if there were additional limits, explicit limits placed on the power of government. Principally, those limits, so the most important of those limits are contained in the First Amendment to the constitution, which establishes most notably and principally for the purposes of this debate, a right to free speech, a right to free speech. Now, it's interesting. The temptation to use power to marginalize and oppress is so prevalent and so constant and so persistent within all of humanity, including within the American experiment and the American nation, that very soon after ratifying a constitution and a bill of rights that contain a right of free speech, even in the founding generation, there began to be attacks on those rights of free speech. The Alien and Sedition Acts come to mind. Other very, there were other attacks, even within the founding generation, on the right of free speech. And you would say, why? Why is that? Why would there be attacks throughout history, throughout American history, on a right of free speech? And the answer is really pretty easy. It's that right of free speech that is most directly and immediately a threat to power, a threat to an establishment, a threat to people who hold the reins of government. And it's, we've seen it time and time again. We've seen people who use the power of free speech to gain power suddenly begin to not see so much the value of free speech when they become the ones who are being criticized. And so we actually have a long and kind of winding and checkered road in the history of the United States in preserving and protecting free speech. It's not a story that necessarily is happy with every single generation. But something interesting began to happen in the 20th century. In the 20th century, the Supreme Court of the United States began to aggressively protect free speech to a degree that it had never done so before. One of the first things that it did, and a lot of people don't realize that, is it incorporated the free speech, the First Amendment, and applied it to state and local governments uh, early in the 20th century, I think mid-1920s. Before, for more than a century, in America, a century and a half in America's founding, a state government could suppress your rights of free speech, and it was perfectly constitutional under the federal constitution, because the federal constitution was held to only restrain the federal government. In fact, that's what many of the slave states used to suppress abolitionist speech was that ability that they had free of the federal government to implement their own speech rules. So the Supreme Court incorporated the First Amendment and applied it to state and local governments using the 14th Amendment as the mechanism. Then it began to change the governing standards and the rules governing free speech. It used to be, for example, there's this famous case called Schenck. Maybe you've heard of There's this quote that you hear from it. It's, uh, no one can quite cry f uh, fire in a crowded theater. It's sort of a, a case that's in a shorthand way used to justify an awful lot of uh, per, uh, suppressions and, and attacks on free speech. Began to liberalize free speech, disregarded the Schenck decision, and announced a new series of standards that were very broadly protective of free speech, and I think more in line with the founder's vision. By 1969, the standards of free speech had been established to where, as a general rule, you're not gonna be able to censor somebody unless their speech was likely to cause imminent lawless action. So for example, right here in this room, I could say, I believe in the violent overthrow of the United States government, and that's protected speech. But if I'm holding the pitchfork and you're all holding pitchforks, and I say, let's storm City Hall now, because I'm inciting violent, imminent violent action, that that would be a, a violation of, that would not be a violation of the First Amendment to suppress that kind of speech. Now, something interesting happened in the United States as free speech 
law changed as our country became more consistent and relentless in protecting individual liberty. What is it that happened? What is it that changed? America had, by many measures, what you would call a civil rights explosion. You began to see dramatic changes in laws that had de jure law, de jure segregation, de jure discrimination against black Americans began to be lifted. We saw massive changes in conceptions of LGBT rights, for example. Huge changes in conceptions of women's rights. We began to see civil rights laws pass. We, got, we began to see uh, critiques of long-standing American legal institutions that had suppressed the few for the sake of the powerful. And the interesting thing is, there's a lot of people who knew that would happen, who knew the liberating power of free speech. Among them, Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist. He gave a speech in Massachusetts when abolitionist speech was being suppressed and his famous comment was that slavery cannot survive free speech. The auction block would be over in the face of free speech. That free speech is the great moral renovator of our government and our society. That's its power. That's its power. And if you look at the moral and cultural and social renovations of the United States of America, in many ways you can trace them exactly. And you can trace them closely to the liberalizing and the freeing of Americans to question authority. The freeing of Americans to say to flawed people who hold power, this is wrong. And to do so without fear of punishment. And so my proposition is that any movement, any um, legal movement, any cultural movement that says to American citizens, well, now we've got it figured out. Now we're not so flawed. Now the people in power are not so flawed. We have figured out truth. We're different now. We're different from every other generation. We can impose rules that will make our society better in part by restricting what other people say rather than by rebutting bad speech with better speech, that those are inherently suspect, that in the language that some folks use, not typically conservatives like me, uh, that's getting on the wrong side of history, that's turning the clock back. But in this case, it would be literally turning the clock back on free speech law. And my suggestion is quite the opposite. My suggestion is that it is that very ability to confront power through the use of free speech that not only limits the exercise of that power, it guarantees the exercise of virtually every other liberty that we enjoy. How would we know that people are losing due process rights unless we can exercise our First Amendment rights? How would we know that people are being deprived the right to counsel, for example, or being subjected to cruel and unusual punishment unless we can use this, our free speech rights? How can we know that someone is losing the um, ability, losing the equal protection of the law unless we are exercising our free speech rights? It is a liberty that guarantees the exercise of all other liberties. Uh, I'll end with this. I was in a conversation with... Um, Walter Fauntroy, with, who was a uh, legendary civil rights leader, is one of the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus, and he was somebody who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. And he, uh, and I say marched with him, not in the sense of like number 100,000 in the crowd, but like right next to him. And I asked him, to what do you attribute your remarkable legal success in the 1950s and 1960s in changing sometimes centuries old laws that uh, discriminated against African Americans? And he said, I'll never forget it. Almighty God and the First Amendment. The First Amendment gave me the ability to speak and Almighty God changed hearts. And I don't think that it in, now or at any time in American history is it the right time to say that we know the answers and we can suppress those who disagree. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, against the motion, please join me in welcoming Shannon Gilreath. So I too would like to express my gratitude to everybody involved in extending this invitation to be in such a lovely place to discuss what I consider to be um, 
perhaps particularly in this uh, historical moment we find ourselves in, a, a rather urgent question. The first thing I want to do is to say very clearly what I think is at stake in this debate. As I said in the Dallas Morning News earlier this week, I do think, actually, that most so-called hate speech, or maybe one should say hateful speech, is in fact protected by the First Amendment. I think people can be justified in expressing hatred of a variety of things for a variety of reasons. Rather, tonight I am concerned only uh, with what I call in my work, in, in my books on this subject, anti-equality speech. To define it simply, this is speech that is really propaganda. It has as its aim the creation or perpetuation of inequality for a targeted group, which when that group has been historically marginalized based on some shared identity characteristic like race or sex or sexual orientation, and where the inequality is accomplished through the dissemination of false or misleading information. Now, this is quite a narrow class of speech, as it should be, because I happen to believe that democracies ought generally to err on the side of more speech and not less. But anti-equality speech, understood properly, is understood as speech and action simultaneously. To be clear, I am not saying that it is action and therefore it is not speech. I am saying that in this context, the two are inseparable. Discrimination, which is really what I'm talking about, does not divide neatly into acts on one side and speech on the other side. Speech acts and acts speak. When it comes to social inequality, this is ineluctably the case. What is an inequality question a question of? It's a question of hierarchy. Speech, in very real and material ways, constructs social reality. It creates hierarchy and people fill it. Now, what's the constitutional basis for a theory that would curtail some speech that qualifies as anti-equality speech? The answer to that question is the 14th Amendment and the 14th Amendment's commitment to equality. Originally, the Constitution, of course, contained no such guarantee, no such commitment to equality. But the modern doctrine of free speech, as Mr. French pointed out, has really crystallized only in the late 1960s, about 100 years after the ground on which our constitutional form of government sits had been resettled by the Reconstruction Amendments following the Civil War. And yet somehow, through the urging of um, mostly liberal organizations like the ACLU, the doctrine of free speech has developed as if the 14th Amendment did not exist. In my view, to exercise equality in any meaningful sense implicates speech in two important ways. First, you have to have a right to speak which is to say you have to have a right to a positive, a positive right to your own voice, we'll put it that way. Second, you have to have a right to be free from speech that is designed to dehumanize and disenfranchise you in the public space. This recognition has in some context in the United States propelled the law to evolve to prohibit certain types of speech such as a sign reading, no blacks served here, or the words of a boss, have sex with me or you're fired. In fact, until very recently, these kinds of, uh, this kind of speech has not been discussed legally as speech at all, but rather as action, with reference to what the words do in real time, which is to say discrimination. They do discrimination. And consequently, the Civil Rights Act and the legal structures that have developed to curtail racism and sexism in various areas of society is not generally seen as problematic viewpoint discrimination, but rather as a prohibition of certain kinds of acts which are inconsistent with a societal commitment to equality. Whether or not that inequality, that discrimination, is accomplished through words only. For example, and brace yourselves for this one, a court had no trouble determining that men chanting cunt in the presence of their only female coworker, amounted to sex discrimination simply because the discriminatory environment was created using only words. In other words, the court saw that speech 
acts. Outside of specific contexts like employment, however, the US approach has been to treat the same kind of targeting speech that would be problematic, say, on the job, as unproblematic, as not implicating equality interests at all. Current free speech doctrine insists that where the speech does not amount to face-to-face -face fighting words or defamation against an individual or uh, is not legally obscene, anything, no matter how racist or how sexist or how degrading, goes. It is worth noting that the U.S. is virtually alone in this approach. Most democratic governments do in fact provide some measure of protection from anti-equality messages in the public sphere. In Germany, for example, the swastika, indeed the Nazi party itself, in, and in addition to that, uh, the so-called Holocaust lie literature, is all criminal, all illegal. Most of these prohibitions, by the way, are simply continuations of policies put in place by the US during its op um, occupation of Germany after the Second War, when the US itself criminalized <coughs> pro-Nazi speech and shut down newspapers. And these same kinds of restrictions exist all across the free world, from Germany to Great Britain to Canada. Countries like Germany saw firsthand the role that anti-identity propaganda created in the legal discrimination and dehumanization of Jews and ultimately the Holocaust. How many of you have heard of Der Sturmer? It was a German newspaper, tabloid-style newspaper, which would no doubt have been a website today, headed by a man named Julius Stryker from 1923 to 1945. Stryker's mission was to disseminate information that defamed, dehumanized, and otherwise rendered Jews susceptible to public scorn. He was massively, massively successful in this. The political theorist Isaiah Berlin has noted that the Germans were, quote, led to believe by those who preached to them by word of mouth or by printed word that there existed people correctly described as subhuman. If you believe it because someone you trust tells you it is true, then you can arrive at a state of mind where it is quite rational to exterminate Jews, close quote. The social environment created through words made average Germans who would take part in the relocation and sometimes murder of Jews heroes or good soldiers or just one of the boys. What happened to Europe's Jews, some might argue, is an isolated case. But is it? The wildly pop popular Nazi propaganda film The Eternal Jew asserted that, quote, at the beginning of the 20th century, the Jew sits at the junction of the world's financial markets. Although only 1% of the population, they terrorize world opinion and world politics, close quote. Robert Knight, leader of the U.S.-based Family Research Council, had this to say at a testimony before Congress. Quote, homosexuals display political control beyond their numbers. A tiny fraction of the world's population, about 1%, homosexuals have one of the largest and fastest growing political action committees in the, in the country. Close quote. Oklahoma State Representative Sally Kern has recently said that homosexuals go after, quote, two-year-olds in schools. Close quote. Similarly, in my home state of North Carolina, Mary Frances Forrester, the wife of a state senator, wrote an op-ed in the right-wing Christian Action League website in which she claimed that part of the revolutionary gay agenda, as she called it, was to rape children and that the average lifespan of homosexual men is 39 years. I'm about to be 41 in case anyone wondered. Stryker blamed Jews for, world war, for the world wars, both Pat Robertson and the late Jerry Falwell blamed gays for the 9-11 attacks. Robertson on his televised show, The 700 Club, routinely blames gay people for all kinds of natural disasters, from hurricanes to earthquakes to floods. Is it any wonder that Benjamin Matthew Williams, the 31-year-old white supremacist who entered the home of a gay couple in Northern California and shot them to death in their bed, defended his actions by asserting, quote, I am not guilty of murder, I am guilty of obeying the laws of my creator." Close quote. The US Constitution does not require neutrality in matters of equality. In fact, we are supposedly a constitutionally, constitutional system anything but neutral on that subject. I think the Constitution's 14th Amendment commitment to equality produces a duty for citizens and government 
to defend equality and to use their faculties to distinguish between that speech, which is in fact designed to degrade, dehumanize, and rob people of equality, and speech that is in favor and furtherance of equality. The US, like other democratic nations, has a duty to confront speech that creates and maintains caste systems among its citizens, whether or not those castes are based on race, sex, or sexual orientation. No constitutional right is absolute. When in the words of the Supreme Court, a compelling interest warrants it, even fundamental rights can be reasonably limited. And I believe that equality is that compelling interest and that a thoughtful, careful approach to anti-identity, anti-equality speech is possible and that it is in fact American. Thanks. Thanks to both of our debaters for joining the debate so clearly and so well. A five-minute rebuttal from David French. I think you're, um, I appreciate your comments very much. And as I told some of the folks here before uh, this debate, I'd listened to some of your presentations and admire the eloquence of your presentation of such a wrong opinion. Uh, <laughs> But I think your, your, your examples that you chose of Nazi Germany and the United States are interesting. Uh, let's consider the impact of a realm of censorship in Nazi Germany. In, in Nazi Germany or in the Weimar Republic, and many times the wannabe censors would have been the anti-Semites. And the censorship that would have followed and the suppression of speech that would have followed would not have been of the speech that led to the Holocaust or inspired people to carry out the Holocaust, but it would have been even more ruthless expression of speech that dissented from the Nazis. And it was interesting to me that you brought up the example of um, people like Pat Robertson here in the United States and others who in recent uh, years have engaged in inflammatory rhetoric about uh, gay Americans that has happened at the exact same time where if you look at the actual numbers in the United States of America and you look at where people are on the issues in the United States of America, people like Pat Robertson have lost the argument rather resoundingly. It turns out that the argument that gays cause hurricanes doesn't really persuade an awful lot of people. Uh, an awful lot of people look at that and reject that message. And in fact, that speech has been counterproductive. Again, a time and again, and this, and I'm talking about, and I'm someone who is a, a conservative Christian, I have a very uh, orthodox Christian view of sexual morality, so there are people who are now changing their minds away from moral views that I would prefer and embracing moral views that others would prefer because of free speech, because of free speech. And my challenge from my side, and when I see something like that, is to, I need to make a better argument. I need, to, uh, I need to figure out a better way to persuade people to my point of view. But I find it very interesting because if you look at Germany, as history, a country with a very different history and a very different culture, and the United States with its own distinct history and culture, what you have seen time and again in the United States is that free speech brings power to the powerless. Any regime of censorship gives po more power to the powerful and relies on trust that the powerful will interpret the, and apply their power in a benevolent fashion. And I, I have to confess, I'm extremely cynical about the ability of the powerful to do this in any rational way. One reason why is, uh, I, think, I think I still hold this title, I may have sued more universities than any living lawyer and over free speech issues. And among the policies that I've attacked on universities that are motivated by, very much by the same impulse that you're presenting, an impulse to try to uh, enhance the equality of the campus, are policies like this. And don't try to think too hard about this one, because if you do, it might melt your brain or tear a hole in the space-time continuum, the logic loop will. Acts of intolerance will not be tolerated. That was an actual policy at a university motivated by many of these same impulses. Acts of intolerance will not be tolerated. So what have we seen? What kind of speech have we seen targeted as dehumanizing? Dehumanizing. Um, just as applied in my own, uh, in my own life and career. Uh, arguments opposing abortion, for example. 
Um, in, the case of this case, in the case where acts of intolerance would not be tolerated, the triggering act for, for a censorship was the university saw a poster on a kid's dorm room with Osama bin Laden's face in, a cross, in the crosshairs. And that was said to be dehumanizing to Muslims. It actually happened to be a pictorial representation of the national policy of the United States of America. Osama bin Laden was quite literally in the crosshairs. And it actually struck me as kind of dehumanizing to Muslims or insulting to Muslims to believe that they would feel dehumanized by an attack on Osama bin Laden. Doesn't that lump them in the wrong, exact wrong direction? Time and time and time again, we hear the language dehumanizing, dehumanizing, dehumanizing as a shortcut designed to try to suppress speech that's actually quite reasonable, quite mainstream, but people just disagree. People just disagree. If you ask 100 people what is a dehumanizing speech, you will get 100 different answers. If you ask 100 people what is hate speech, you will get 100 different answers. We should not give any person the power of determining what is dehumanizing speech, particularly when that is so often wrapped up in self-interest and the continued attainment and the advancement and furtherance of their power. Thanks so much, and a five-minute rebuttal from Shannon Gilworth. So uh, the uh, reason we have legislators is so that there aren't 100 different legal definitions for the same thing under the law. Um, we have legislators determine all sorts of meanings uh, with regard to speech, including what is sexual harassment, what is obscenity, and so on. I'm afraid that none of the examples offered would, in my view, constitute anti-equality speech. They don't fit the definition that I provided in terms of minority classification. And for that reason, although they're interesting, um, I don't think that they would, in fact, be in any way limited by the policy that I suggest. I would like to take a, a few minutes and clear up what I think is a fairly common misunderstanding about a position that advocates some curtailment of anti-equality messages, and that is that people are too easily offended and should simply grow thicker skins. I'm not talking about hurt feelings. Reducing the very real injuries that uh, result from verbal discrimination campaigns to hurt feelings, rather than to recognize them as tangible losses of things like employment opportunities or educational opportunities or in fact physical safety in public places is to misunderstand, in fact I would say to profoundly misunderstand how power actually works in a socially unequal society. Let me give you an example. If I were to stand up here and say, um, I think that, contrary to all the facts, uh, there's something inherent about white straight men that makes them molest or otherwise rape children. And therefore, I don't think that they should be able to be public school teachers. Uh, you might think that this is ridiculous, um, hysterical, whatever adjective you'd like to apply, but it probably isn't going to make that much difference in social context for how many straight white men have at their disposal employment opportunities in public grammar schools. If, however, I make that same statement, right, about homosexual men, gay men are inclined to rape children, it's a safety issue. In social context in which there is a stigma that is live attached to the frequent dissemination of this lie, then in fact it probably is going to affect Again, in context, right? Context matters, community matters, but it is probably going to affect the number of jobs available to gay men in public education. Context matters, and power in real time matters. Um, I'd also say that the anti-Semitic speech campaigns that led to the uh, 
dehumanization and group-based liquidation of Jews in Germany was not about mere neutral opinion. And its logical outcome, which of course happened to be mass murder, did not amount to mere hurt feelings any more than Kristallnacht was about just so much broken glass. Power and the way it is operating in the material world is what animates a theory of anti-equality speech. And of course, any theory can be abused if it is taken uh, to represent only counterfactuals. We'd have to take a serious and thoughtful approach to what's actually going on in the, in the world around us. Insofar as the argument is that free speech has led to all these wonderful advances, I think, um, particularly with regard to anti-slavery speech, that story is ahistorical, because in fact, most anti-slavery speech was suppressed. Um, most of these gains took place in spite of, not because of, uh, 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 malformations of a commitment to free speech. And in fact, of course, the civil rights movement had already accomplished much of its work before the Supreme Court uh, settled on the imminent lawless action standard announced in the Brandenburg decision. The final point I'd like to make is that it can happen here, it is happening here, and if you look at FBI statistics, which of course uh, is hardly a bastion of liberalism, uh, what you find is that rates of physical violence in the United States uh, against, violence against gay people um, is actually rising, not declining. As more rights are won in courts and more rhetoric like that of Pat Robertson and others is ramped up to a new decibel level, more physical violence is taking place against gay people. Right now, perhaps in the context of the boycott and divestment movement, Jewish students are experiencing a spike in physical violence on college campuses across this country. As Louis Bondi, the antiquarian, wrote as Julius Streicher was awaiting his trial at Nuremberg, it is necessary to be well acquainted with the methods by which the Nazis tried to spread their doctrines. It cannot happen here. It's too easy an attitude to take up. All of those who wish to see human liberty preserved will have to be on their guard against any recurrence of the events of the last decade. Many thanks to both of our debaters for such powerful presentations, and it's now my great pleasure to pose questions to each of them for about 15 minutes as you write down your questions, and uh, we will then continue from there. So I'd like to begin with a question about original understanding of the Constitution. Uh, David, as I heard you, you were saying that the Supreme Court was right to hold in the Brandenburg case decided in 1969 that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent lawless action. Mm -hmm. That's a standard that came from Justice Brandeis's concurrence in the Whitney case in 1927. But the framers of the Constitution might not have accepted that standard. They passed the Sedition Act of 1798. They allowed all the suppression of all sorts of speech criticizing the government. How can an originalist accept your position? Well, any, and any originalist begins with the text. So you're, when I say originalism, you're beginning with a uh, impl implication of textualism and originalism. So in, if you're interpreting any law, you look at the text. And, and this, the text here, which Congress shall make no law um, re restricting the freedom of speech, is interesting in that it's absolutist on its face, combined with an interesting, especially compared to other clauses in the First Amendment, relative absence of in-depth discussion on the limits and boundaries of that right. And so when you begin with broad language, very broad language, um, combined with a, the limited, a, more, a more limited historical record on what was meant by that language, that leads a person who's a textualist slash originalist to focus on the language. 
uh, focus on the language. And what I, and, and what I said in my beginning uh, remarks was that one of the things that you see is the corrupting influence of power, even on our founding fathers. Because it's one thing to be a coalition of, folk, a, a coalition of delegates in a, in a constitutional convention when you don't know who's going to run the place. It's another thing entirely to start running the place. And so when you start running the place, we see this temptation to censor happen again and again and again. Uh, and it's something that plagued even the founding generation. So, so I think the fact of the matter that the, that the founders were actually so fallible as to impose the Alien and Sedition Acts once some of them gained power. And by the way, when they did, there were other founders who were furious about that, furious about that, <laughs> demonstrates this universal temptation and tendency to try to accumulate power and to try to suppress dissent. And one thing that I would note about the, um, uh, Shannon's absolutely right, free speech didn't end slavery. It took a war to end slavery. Um, but I would also note at that time, and one of the reasons why Frederick Douglass was so passionate about free speech is our country, our country's, free, uh, record, our country's legal regime regarding free speech at that time was unrecognizable to what it is today. Unrecognizable, far more um, far more censorship was permitted. In fact, some of the uh, arguments put forth in the antebellum South to suppress abolitionist speech were very much like some of the arguments you hear on college campuses today to suppress speech. I, that speech emotionally injures me. The way abolitionists speak about slave owners emotionally injures me. And so that kind of justification was used to, to justify some of the worst, the worst oppression in American history. Uh, so time and again, when we shut off, here's, here's the interesting thing about free speech. Free speech is a guarantor and a protector of peaceful change because the human desire to change the world for the better does not go away when you're censored. It doesn't go away. It gets channeled often in destructive ways. It gets channeled in revolutionary ways. It gets channeled in violent ways. It gets channeled in, in military ways, for example, with our own civil war. And so one of the great virtues of free speech, particularly in a culture as diverse as ours, far more diverse at its founding than any of the more monocultural, culturally homogenous European nations, a nation as diverse as ours, as pluralistic as ours, we have to have that safety valve because that impulse to change the world and to change the country won't go away if you can't speak. But if you can't speak, you'll channel it in less productive ways. Great. Uh, a, uh, Shannon, a question about originalism for you, this time about the original understanding of the 14th Amendment, mm. ratified in 1868, unlike the First Amendment, ratified in 1791. Um, as David mentioned, the people who supported the 14th Amendment, in particular John Bingham, really cared about free speech. They were worried about racist Southerners preventing abolitionist speech from being mailed uh, through the mails. And they invoked framers like Jefferson on behalf of the complete freedom of conscience and essentially endorsed the idea that speech could only be banned if it was intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Mm. So if the framers of the 14th Amendment intended to embrace the standard that David is arguing for, why do you think that the 14th Amendment should be construed uh, in a different way? Well, I mean, I think the question assumes that I think originalism is the appropriate interpretive uh, commitment, <laughs> and I don't. Um, I, I mean, I'm not really sure why we're, some people anyway, are so terribly concerned about what people long dead thought about any particular constitutional provision, when the reality is they didn't even agree among themselves what the appropriate meaning uh, to any given provision might be. Uh, I'm concerned with a constitution that is relevant to an evolving society and evolving commitments including the commitment to equality. And I don't think that you can say that a class of citizens so defined by their group identification, which is, by the way, often not an identification they choose, um, can actually be said to have equal protection of the laws when propaganda campaigns against them, which take away equal opportunity in a whole host of ways, 
remain unfettered and unregulated. So, I mean, if equal protection of the laws means anything, it has to mean at least that. Um, whether or not that's somehow congruent with an original understanding is not particularly important to me. D David, in endorsing the imminent lawless action standard, uh, Justice Brandeis had an inspiring faith in the ability of public reason to triumph. And he said the best response to evil counsels is good ones, because as long as there's time enough for deliberation, then truth will prevail. In an age of the internet, of fake <laughs> news and 24 seven cable, was Brandeis too optimistic about the power of counter speech to promote thoughtful deliberation? And if so, should the imminent lawless action standard be reconsidered? There's a shorter way to ask that question. Can the First Amendment survive Twitter? Um, I don't know. So here, here is the, here is the, and this is, th there are two issues here. I'm going to back up a little bit. There is the legal protection of free speech, which is mainly what we've been talking about, which is very, very important, and that's what the First Amendment deals with. What is the role of government in regulating speech? I would say more important, if you want to protect free speech, is the culture of free speech. So you can have a government that says, I'm not going to censor you, but if you have a culture that is centered around public shaming, name-calling, etc., then you're going to also, you are often find people who have a freedom to speak in theory, but won't speak because the social costs are so high. So when I write about free speech, I'll write about the culture of free speech as often as I write, almost as often as I write about the legal structure of free speech. And the issue you have with our current social media environment is often one um, of algorithms, of matching, of the ability of our technology to match people of like mind together so that there isn't the space that Brandeis talks about at all. Instead, what locks in is something called the law of group polarization. And this, guys, is a super important topic to understand our culture. And the law of group polarization is this. When people of like mind gather, whether it's in a room or in online, the common expression of their shared beliefs tends to become more extreme. And that's something that we are seeing all the time. Like-minded communities gather. They convince each other of the rightness of their position and the wrongness of the, uh, of the opposing side. And the common expression grows ever more extreme. And it's a bipartisan issue right now. It's an absolute bipartisan issue, but it's primarily a cultural issue. There is no law that's gonna swoop in and effectively tell Facebook and Twitter how to, re to remake their algorithms and to rework their customer base to make people more civil and more willing to engage. It's a real cultural issue. I don't see that the law is gonna be able to help us there. Uh, Shannon, I'd like to understand the scope of your proposed alternative to the imminent lawless action standard, which I took as forbidding speech that's false and misleading uh, information about historically marginalized groups that is designed to degrade and rob them of equality. Mm -hmm. Was Brandenburg wrong? That was a case where a guy stands up at a Ku Klux Klan rally and says, unless there is something done about the race situation in this country, white people might have to take revengeance. The Supreme Court held that that speech was protected because it wasn't intended to and likely to cause imminent lawless action. Do you think that case was wrong and should be overturned? And then, do you believe that Facebook and Google are correct to ban speech that is uh, designed to degrade people on the basis of race, religion, and uh, gender, mm -hmm. uh, and should the First Amendment be construed to embrace the Facebook and Google standards? Oh, okay, well, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, Better you than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, for, first, I would say um, Brandenburg, of course, Brandenburg, you know, the uh, speaker said a lot more than, than just that in, in, in that case. I mean, what bothers me about the Brandenburg decision is it's a curious country in which the law is permitted to respond, even encouraged to respond, to an exhortation that says, go kill that nigger now, but is not permitted to respond in any enlightened or useful way 
to pervasive, insidious propaganda campaigns accusing black Americans of every kind of depravity and inferiority, including lower intellects, laziness, sexual lasciviousness, lasciviousness uh, criminality of all kinds, that then creates for that class of people so targeted an environment in which, based on the color of their skin, they are denied opportunities in employment, in education, and indeed, one must say, in physical safety. Um, and by the way, from the state itself, right, in, in, the, in the form of police brutality and other forms of institutionalized violence based on stereotypes. So um, it, it just doesn't seem to me to make any sense to say uh, you have to directly incite someone to kill a person before we can do anything to respond to anti-equality propaganda campaigns. It, it's, it's illogical, it's utterly nonsensical. And in fact, what it does is to entrench power, right? It entrenches power because it says to most marginalized people, unless your attackers stray over this very singular line and call for your murder or some form of violence against you, which by the way, doesn't only have to intend to produce that violence, but has to be likely to produce it in the mind of some court, right? Um, then you're on your own. And in fact, the ability of people to abuse you through these kinds of campaigns is actually going to be called their fundamental constitutional right. Um, so that's Brandenburg. With regard to Facebook and Twitter and other things, uh, I mean, I think the reality is there can be a law that swoops in and deals with, this sort, sort, with these sorts of situations. Um, if that law is one as I have outlined, that targets uh, speech campaigns against historically marginalized people. Um, it's really not that difficult to see unless one doesn't want to see. I mean, recently um, I went on a, uh, a, a, a vacation in, in which I went to the beach and I posted some photographs on Facebook of some friends of mine and I in, you know, swimsuits. And then I got a notification from Facebook that said, your um, photograph has been reported and removed for being pornographic content. Uh, and at first I was flattered. And then I said, um, <laughs> you know, clearly there is someone out there, right, um, whose job it is um, to decide that this, you know, this photograph of a shirtless man is incompatible with. So if Facebook can target those sorts of postings um, in, in ways I think which are rather ridiculous and silly, but I don't feel particularly oppressed by them, I don't see why Facebook can't also respond in useful ways as guided by legislatures to speech campaigns that do the work of disenfranchising their targets, um, particularly in an era in which the echo chamber that is social media makes what might otherwise just seem silly or absurd catch like wildfire among people who are already disposed to believe it. Uh, David, as, as Shannon notes, uh, sexual harassment law in the workplace does forbid speech that is, uh, demeans uh, women in a severe and pervasive way. And some critics challenged sexual harassment law when it was first created as a violation of the First Amendment. It clearly doesn't comport with the Brandenburg Standard, but the Supreme Court rebuffed those claims. So why isn't Shannon correct that if it's okay to restrict uh, the Brandenburg Standard in the workplace, it's not also okay to restrict it on college campuses given the unique context of college campuses? Well, the difference, that, that the problem I have with Shannon's position compared to sexual harassment law, for example, is that Shannon's position, it would be explicitly, view, explicitly viewpoint discriminatory, uh, as opposed to sexual harassment law, which is at its core viewpoint, viewpoint neutral. What, it, what essentially is happening here is the sexual, sexual harassment law is not all that different from any other law that we have where speech is, as Shannon said, connected to some, uh, something in the physical world that directly impacts your ability, say in this case, to do your job. 
So what's very important about sexual harassment law, it's not just severe or pervasive. It's so severe or pervasive that it becomes essentially like a term or condition of your employment. And that's a very important distinction. So those same words that you might utter repeatedly in an office, in an office are not going to be unlawful if you utter them outside the office. But it's, that, it's the time, it's the place, it's the manner. And time, place, and manner type restrictions have long been recognized in, in constitutional law. The problem I have, and what's very different about Shannon's position, is he's talking about something that's directly targeting particular viewpoints, particular ideas. And so it is, it is not the time, place, and manner, it's the idea itself that is gonna be ruled out of bounds. And, and you know, Shannon said, well, you know, we have legislators to make these hard decisions. But one thing that I would note is we've kind of had these little laboratories all over the country that have shared a lot of Shannon's views about speech, and they've been called colleges and universities. And they're run by people, very high IQ people, who deal with far more culturally homogenous uh, communities, tend to be upper middle class, tend to be generally in the same ideology, uh, or very similar ideology compared to the larger culture. And they've been really wrestling for years and trying to restrict specifically speech that dehumanizes, restrict speech that uh, anti-equality speech, and it has been an absolute disaster. It has been an absolute disaster. Um, I wouldn't even say there's a slippery slope. There's no slope. It immediately starts to, to when, you, when you attempt to do what Shannon is, is, is suggesting, you immediately begin to sweep in entire categories of speech. And I know Shannon would say, no, not under my regime, not under my regime. But an awful lot of really, really smart people have been trying to accomplish exactly what Shannon is trying to accomplish on these college campuses. And I ask you, when you look at our college campuses and you look at the suppressed rage that exists, the, I mean, we're, we're reaching a point on some campuses where progressive is turning on progressive to such an extent that professors are suffering PTSD, where they're going off campus because they're not physically safe to be on campus because they objected to a particular form of progressive protest. And I'm not talking, you know, rabid right-wingers like me. I'm talking Bernie bros going off campus to conduct their classes because it's not safe for them. And so, you know, when I, when, I, when I have debates like this and I have discussions like this, I'm constantly thinking, we've tried this. This has been tried. There's an ongoing laboratory of democracy for about 30 years now. And it's the various efforts of, of campus administrators to satisfy and to deal with the very concerns that Shannon has very eloquently raised. And what has resulted from that is it illustrates many of the problems that I've articulated. It gives more power to the powerful. It doesn't actually suppress views. It creates increasing amounts of bitterness. It creates increasing amounts of division. Uh, it's not susceptible to definition, to, to any sort of, not just easy definition, but any sort of uh, consistent definition at all. And it has resulted in environments now that in many ways, when you look at what the academy's become, especially some of our, some of our institutions, they're national laughing stocks. And that's, that's the road. Um, that's what we see happens. It's right in front of us. Uh, this uh, question is for uh, Professor Gilreath. The 14th Amendment says states must not deny to any person equal protection of the laws. How can you justify restricting the First Amendment in a dubious effort to mandate equality in economic or social status? Uh, well, because I don't think it can be said that a group of people who is subject to um, pervasive speech campaigns that are designed to um, marginalize them, to politically disenfranchise them, to cast them as somehow socially worthless, unemployable, uneducatable, et cetera, can be said to have equal protection of the laws in any meaningful sense. Um, you see, I think neutrality is simply a mask for powerful people's opinions uh, becoming law. I, I don't think that people in groups targeted as the way I have described 
um, can actually exercise any constitutional right uh, so long as they are considered sub-citizen, subhuman, etc. So I think in some ways what the question is asking me is alien to the frame so far as I see it, right? I, I don't think um, equality can exist in any real sense uh, without some reasonable 14th Amendment based approach to interpreting the First Amendment. And um, I, you know, I think that, that the reality is U.S. law has recognized that in some contexts, sexual harassment being one of those contents, uh, contexts, which I would say is uh, sexual harassment is by definition not uh, viewpoint neutral. Um, but what we've seen the law do is to say, listen, regardless of the viewpoint communicated, and there is a viewpoint communicated, right? When you say, have sex with me or you're fired, right? You are communicating a viewpoint about uh, the target of that speech, what she's for, um, which is essentially sexual availability. Um, there's a viewpoint there, as, as there are in, in most verbal expressions. What we're concerned with is the action, the discrimination that is inseparable from that language. In other words, I'm talking about speech that cannot say what it says without also doing what it says in real time. And I think that's the distinction. The sort of college campus examples and other things, um, most of the time, where they go off the rails is that they are concentrating on hurt feelings or some emotional injury. And that is by far and away outside the bounds of the theory that I have uh, offered, offered today. We have uh, several specific examples that our audience wants both speakers to comment on. And uh, David, first to you, are situations like burning the Quran or kneeling at an NFL football game when so many people are offended, protected by the First Amendment or not? Oh man, I got a whole album side on that. <laughs> um, you know, let's deal with the NFL first because that's on everybody's minds. In 1942, January, the Wisconsin, I mean the West Virginia School Board passed a resolution that required students to stand and offer a salute and say uh, a pled the Pledge of Allegiance or a Pledge of Allegiance. Now let's remember what was happening in January of 1942. In January of 1942, we were not just at, in, the World War in World War II, we were losing. We were losing. This resolution was passed right before the Bataan Campaign started in the Philippines. And for those of you who don't study World War II history, Arguably, the Bataan campaign was the worst military loss in the history of the United States. The, the scale of the devastation and the scale of the human lives lost is just beyond imagining. We can't even imagine it in this world where the U.S. military seems so powerful. It wasn't just that the United States' existence was at stake. Western civilization's existence was at stake. So if there is ever a time to demand that Americans stand and recite a Pledge of Allegiance, especially when those kids were, might be in the next year or so enlisting, or their fathers were enlisting at that moment. That was it. National unity was absolutely, value, uh, was absolutely critical to the existence of our nation. And the Supreme Court in 1943, this 1943, the war wasn't won in 1943, guys. It was still hanging in the balance. Said, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official Higher petty can prescribe what is orthodox in law, in matters of law, politics, nationalism, religion. It's one of the most powerful constitutional statements given the context that our nation, that our Supreme Court has ever delivered. And I would say if it doesn't require students, if we cannot require students to stand in the middle of our nation's, one of our nation's two greatest wars, one of the wars where the nation hung in existence, then the First Amendment's broad enough to encompass an NFL player taking a knee in a time of relative peace. Uh, and we shouldn't be all that concerned about it. And in fact, we should look at that and say, you know what? 
I want people to stand for the flag because they love this country, not because they feel like they have to or they'll be fired. And I, I, I have found it, and this is sort of my, uh, something that I've been saying to a lot of conservative audiences. Let's focus on asking people to stand out of love and teaching them to love this country rather than forcing them to stand because they're afraid. Because that, I believe, is antithetical to the culture of free speech. And so when we say to a kneeling player, I disagree with you, but I understand why you kneel, would like to talk to you about why you kneel. You know what you're doing? You're advancing a culture of free speech and you're standing in the shoes of one of the greatest Supreme Court decisions in the history of the United States. So that's how I feel about the NFL. What was the other one, burning Korans? Um, look, <laughs> I, I, you can burn anything you wanna burn. Um, burn in, you can burn it. I disagree with burning an American flag. I disagree with burning a Bible. I disagree with burning a Koran. Um, but context matters. If you burn a Koran right in front of a mosque, um, the, there's gonna be a, some questions about are you creating an environment where you're trying to incite imminent lawless action? Um, but I, I don't think that any object is sacred. Uh, I'll give you a real life case. Um, I it was involved in the litigation at San Francisco State University where the college Republicans stomped on the flag of Hamas, um, a terrorist organization. And they were brought up on charges by the university acting under policies where they're trying to ensure equality for desecrating the name of Allah. This is in the United States of America at a public university. Fortunately, uh, the university changed course uh, after litigation was filed. Their speech code was struck down. But, you know, I think that you raise an interesting and, and, and important example because where I think I disagree with Shannon is if I see as a Christian someone burning a Bible I don't look at that and feel helpless. I understand that I have power in that, in that moment and I have the power of my speech. And I have the power to answer bad speech with better speech. And one of the things that is consistent, and I, I'm just gonna keep emphasizing this until I'm blue in the face, is that in the environment where American free speech jurisprudence and the American culture of free speech has been opened, we have seen more and better social change on front after front after front than we did before our free speech environment was so open. And why is that? It's because people were able to answer bad speech with better speech. You're never powerless. You're never powerless. You don't ever have to just look to the state and say, save me and help me from this speech. You can answer it. And when you answer it and you answer it with a better argument, you not only empower yourself, you change a nation. And that's an extraordinary act. Thanks so much. Uh, Shannon, same uh, excellent uh, examples from our audience. To you, does the First Amendment protect an NFL player taking the knee during the national anthem or burning the Quran? Uh, uh, so I think the First Amendment does, I mean, we are, they, these, these examples are, uh, of course, actually related to the question of anti-equality speech, but as a general matter, uh, yes, I think the First Amendment does protect somebody kneeling during the national anthem to protest inequality and police brutality. Um, and I think um, it, it would also protect burning the Quran or any other book for that matter. I mean, frankly, I, I think books should not be burned. They should stand for the, you know, as evidence of the harm that they actually do produce in the world, if in fact they do produce harm in the world. Um, so I, I don't have any problem with the First Amendment protecting those things, uh, as I think they should. I think to some degree, sort of suppressed in a piously even-handed discussion about this, is the idea that um, there's no constitutional basis for distinguishing between speech that advocates equality, like protest over uh, police brutality, um, and speech that advocates inequality. Um, in fact, I think the 14th Amendment is the basis for making that distinction legislatively. Um, and I also think it's a terrible misconception 
um, although a, a, an awfully common and convenient argument, to say that the answer to every situation is more speech. Yes, in a country in which uh, people who identify religiously overwhelmingly identify as Christian, uh, someone witnessing the Bible being burned would in fact be in a position of power. That is unquestionable. Um, but I don't think, um, you know, when black students are confronted with posters that say blacks go back to Africa, um, I, I think it's a little disingenuous to consider that as an invitation to some sort of dialogue about race relations. Um, it's no more an invitation to dialogue about re race relations than it is an invitation to some exotic vacation. Um, it's simply not true in social context. And so again, what I would say is, um, for a theory like mine to be operable in a reasonable way, of course we have to make distinctions um, that turn on context, on, on a community context, and how power is actually operating in the real world, not simply abstractly in our head. Great, uh, one last question for each debater and then closing arguments. Uh, David, could you draw a tangible line between anti-equality speech and government tyranny and oppression? A line between anti-equality speech and government, government tyranny and oppression. I could see government oppression in the name of suppressing anti-equality speech. I can see that happening very, very clearly. I think you see that happen often on, quite often on college campuses. Uh, that's where you'll see those in, posi in positions of power use uh, the fig leaf of anti-equality type, uh, of suppressing anti-equality speech to terminate debate, to deny economic opportunities, for example, in faculty positions, to deny uh, educational opportunities. That happens distressingly often on college campuses. Um, but I don't honestly know what anti-equality speech is. Um, you know, I, I, I have gotten some of the examples, you know, that are, that are on the extreme edge, like a Klan flyer. Um, but, you know, I, that, those, kinds of, those kinds of events have occurred on college campuses. And I remember when I was president of FIRE, I got a call from a provost at a major state university in the South and he said, we just got some Klan flyers on campus. Um, we're wanting to shut down our free speech zone to prevent it. Um, because he knew he couldn't just explicitly target the Klan legally and, and allow everyone else to speak. And I asked him a question. I said, what's happening on your college campus? He said, well, obviously a lot of students are upset about it. And I said, and he said, well, we don't want and I, and I asked him this, I said, are you afraid you can't rebut the Klan? And he said, well, of course not. Of course not. I said, he said, we've got a take back the night style rally where we're going to have probably a thousand students expressing love and support for members of our community. We're going to have a teach in about the history of the Klan and its terrorist uh, orientation. And then I said, well, what about the flyer itself? What does the flyer itself say? Well, it's a, it's a typo-riddled piece of nonsense. I said, so you're wanting to implement a regime of censorship when the, when the reaction to this speech has been an outpouring of love for African-American students, a moment of teaching where people now know more about this domestic terrorist organization than they knew before, so they know why they hate the Klan other than being told, hey, these are bad people. And the Klan itself's expression is so <coughs> subliterate that it's not persuading anybody. And you're wanting to, it sounds to me like what you have here is an example where free speech has resulted in a triumph. Uh, and, and where free speech has resulted in a win for equality. Whereas you wouldn't have had that, sim, sim, a, that similar outcome had you simply shut down your free speech zone. And, and I think that, you know, a time and again, we look at an event and we say, and, I, and, and I, 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 I know you're not saying that we're dealing with hurt feelings, and we're not dealing with hurt feelings, but I've never seen a legal regime enacted by any 
well-meaning institution that's seeking to regulate rules of speech to accomplish equality that doesn't define offensive speech or unlawful speech by the subjective listener response to it, which then places my free speech rights, your free speech rights, often directly in the hands of the most sensitive listener. And that is not free speech, folks. That's not free speech. It's an exercise of power over a, a, by a, a governmental or quasi-governmental or powerful private entity over a less powerful person. That's what it is. That's what every act of censorship is. And so what I have seen is the, quote, equality imperative being used to justify the exercise of power by powerful people in one context over less powerful people in that same context. That's how it works. Because you can't have the less powerful censor the more powerful. Not possible. It's always the more powerful censoring the less powerful. That's how it works. And however you want to cast the rhetoric in the name of the dispossessed or the marginalized, if you're censoring, you've got the power. You're not dispossessed. You're not marginalized in that context. You have the power. And that's the problem I have. And what we see is that power being exercised time and time again in ways that are arbitrary, targeted, and many times vicious. And free speech is the best answer for that. Last, last question to Shannon. Do you think there's any danger of government oppression if anti-equality speech is restricted? Any danger of government oppression, did you say? Um, I, I mean, I'm assuming that question means oppression by the government of citizens. Um, I mean, I think that there will be people, n namely um, people who are now less able to propagate racist, sexist, and homophobic propaganda campaigns, who will feel that they are being oppressed <laughs> by a law that takes equality seriously. I think that's probably a reality. Um, and I also think that there will be missteps. I think that there will be um, sensitive questions that arise uh, in the same way, of course, that there are instances with sexual harassment law or with Title IX on college campuses that sometimes go awry. Do I think that we are in a better world because Title VII and Title IX of the Civil Rights Act exist? Yes. Um, do I think that the ability of people to be overtly racist and sexist in public ways has changed because the cultural ethic has changed uh, over the decades since the Civil Rights Act was enacted? Yes. Um, so while I think that there may be situational, uh, shall we say, instances in which the law is misapplied, um, I think the risk is worth it in the context of equality. Uh, I also think that the empirical evidence is there for anyone who wants to engage with it that speech, anti, what I have determined to, to be anti-equality speech, um, is in fact directly related to levels of not only tangible economic loss for the targeted groups, but for levels of physical violence, even murder against those same groups. Those statistics are there, they are available. So I, all, I, I do believe that there is something a bit backward in an argument that says um, the status quo does not represent the interests of the powerful. Of course, a status quo becomes a status quo because powerful people support it. I think, right, if, if what I have on my side of this argument is empirical evidence of economic loss, physical loss, and worse, bodies piling up, and what's on the other side of the argument is a, commit, a worry about theoretical oppression of an abstract commitment to an abstraction that we call free speech. 
shouldn't the burden be on the other side to convince everyone that what I say won't work, can't work, rather than the burden be on me to prove that in every instance it will work perfectly? I think, in fact, we're risking far more by not trying. Wonderful. Uh, before we come to closing statements, please join me in thanking our debaters uh, for the forum. It is now time for closing arguments in this superb debate, and the first one for three minutes is to David French. So first I would say you don't actually have empirical evidence that any given kind of speech adds up to bodies in the streets. You just don't have that. That doesn't exist. Um, what exists are you know, various studies about rates of hate crimes relating to various world events, um, rates of hate crimes that ebb and flow for millions of different cultural factors. Um, when we can tie a hate crime directly to speech, we have often uh, can tie it in a sense that Brandenburg relates to it. There was speech that motivated imminent lawless action. And the question that I have is, is a speech restriction going to be more effective at preventing crimes than felony statutes that can cost a person their life if they commit murder, their liberty if they commit a robbery? Um, all of their worldly goods if they violate the civil rights of a person under civil rights statute. So then we're going to fix this by suppressing liberty by the powerful against people who have less powerful? No, I don't think so. There's not empirical evidence that that's the case. But what we do know and what we do understand and what people who have been part of movements throughout American history that have achieved social change for the good and for the betterment of our society have understood is they could not do it without the right of free speech. And what we do know and what we do understand throughout American history is that when that right of free speech has been denied, when the ability to engage in dialogue and discourse has been suppressed, the impulse for social change in this country doesn't go away. It just manifests, it, it manifests itself in more violent ways. It manifests, it manifests itself in very destructive ways. The founders were flawed but wise men. They formed a nation made up of disparate religions and disparate cultures, and it's fashionable to say they're just a bunch of white, mainly Protestants, but the differences that existed at that time and when they created this country were differences that had torn Europe to shreds in wars that, with death tolls that we didn't see again until World War I. That's how profound those differences were. And they created this country and they realized that they needed to create a safety valve a safety valve that not only protected America from future generations, but a safety valve that it turns out should have been used to protect America from some of their own worst impulses. And that's the First Amendment. And one of the great advances of American history, of American society, and of American culture was the Supreme Court beginning in the 20th century to look at the text of that amendment Look at the text of the 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection of the laws. There's actual words on that page, equal protection of the laws. It's not a social justice super clause that says equality. It actually has words, equal protection of the laws, and actual words regarding Congress's uh, inability to restrict the freedom of his speech, and begin to put those things together in a way that empowered every person in this room and continues to empower every person in this room. And America will never be perfect. It will never be perfect. However, one thing we know and one thing that we understand from history and from the knowledge of our own culture is if in the name of trying to make America perfect, we make it less free, we will break this place apart. We will fracture this country and we will shut off the most powerful engines for social change that have ever been created. As Frederick Douglass said, the First Amendment and free speech is an engine of moral renovation 
And our moral renovations are not yet complete and they'll never be complete. That's why we always must protect the right of free speech. Thank you so much for the last closing argument to Shannon Gilreath. So equal protection of the laws. Um, let me say this, liable, which is the intentional dissemination of false information in order to injure the reputation of an individual, is prescribed in every US jurisdiction. As a consequence, reputational harm to those who are allowed to be individuals, which is to say, namely, straight white men in this society, is prohibited. Their reputations are secured and safeguarded by the law and through the law. Conversely, people who are defined and falsely maligned through their membership in groups, often when the group designation isn't even one they chose, like race, for example, which is to say anyone who isn't a straight white man, have no legal recourse. In fact, they are told that the ability to define and therefore defame through that definition and thereby to injure them is someone else's protected constitutional right. How exactly is there equal protection of the laws in this? This is a bizarre system that avoids the inescapable reality that groups are composed of individuals, individuals who suffer the effects and tangible losses of group-based libel campaigns as individuals. It is a curious country, I think, in which the law can respond to the exhortation, kill that faggot now, but is not allowed to respond to the verbal discrimination campaigns that create the environment in which people would be disposed to kill that faggot now because somebody tells them to. It is a peculiarly American delusion to think you can split off from the words that constitute the social environment the harm that flows through that social environment. I would also just remind everyone who is apparently um, with Mr. French thinking that Germany and England and Canada and others are totalitarian regimes, that these protections do in fact work um, in environments in which censoring or silencing some forms of particularly egregious anti-equality speech have not in fact ended free speech. I will say that the slippery slope argument is a common one. It has been brought up here tonight. In my view, it is a convenient doctrinal referent, no less conservative than it is liberal, for doing nothing. I sometimes wonder, considering the idea that silencing anti-equality speech is going to ineluctably lead to the silencing of all other kinds of speech, since that is sort of rather obviously juvenile, what could the slippery slope that people fear most really be? Maybe the slide they fear most is a slide to actual equality, a slide to a legal regime in which bigots are actually held accountable for the work that their propaganda campaigns do in the real world. Equality, it seems to me, is the central proposition of the United States Constitution today. And silencing speech, regulating speech, that impairs the equality of all citizens does not require a dramatic rethinking of our constitutional system. In fact, the US Supreme Court has in every other area recognized that a compelling interest can constitute government action that reasonably restricts fundamental constitutional rights. The only thing that I'm submitting to you tonight is that equality is that compelling interest. And in my view, unless the 14th and First Amendments are interpreted together to produce a just result 
then there will never be equality in this country. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before we vote, once again, please join me in thanking our debaters. All right, now for the extraordinarily important final vote. You have heard the debates. You have listened closely. You have separated your political from your constitutional views. In light of what you have heard, I want you once again to vote on the motion. Do you agree with the resolution the First Amendment protects hate speech. If you vote yes, hit yes and hit send. If you vote no, hit no and hit send. Once you hit your response, your answer will be displayed back to you, which means your response has been recorded. And after you have cast that path-breaking vote, we have one final question which will appear on your device. Yes or no, I now better understand the opposing view. And once again, highlight your answer, hit send, and your answer will be displayed back, which means it has been recorded. Excellent. Okay, now as the crack constitutional prep team is tallying the responses, I need to talk with you about the importance of these debates and the urgency of having your help here in Dallas and around the country. We're going to come back to Dallas, thanks to Harlan. We're going to do a series of these constitutional debates here at Old Parkland. And one of the purposes of these debates is to educate this extraordinary group that's heard come out to hear them. But we need to educate the whole country. We need to bring these arguments, which are the best arguments that exist for and against the motion, to learners of all ages across America. And we need to do that by recording and distributing this content online. We have, at the Constitution Center, an extraordinary platform co-sponsored by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. It's called the Interactive Constitution. I've told you about this before. I want you to download it if you haven't already. Not now, because you must listen to every word I'm saying. But after the debate, it has gotten 15 million hits since it launched two years ago. Wow is right. There is a hunger in this country to hear the best liberal and conservative scholars nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society writing about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. So you can click on the First Amendment and see Jeffrey Stone and Eugene Volokh nominated by both of your great societies with a thousand words about what they agree the First Amendment means, and then separate statements of disagreement. It's an extraordinary tool. There are 80 clauses of the Constitution. I teach constitutional law. I don't know about most of them. I learn from them every day, and I want you to download this tool to learn about the Constitution, and then to think with us at the Constitution Center about how to create lessons plans that will bring this stuff into schools. We have a weekly podcast, We the People, where every week I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative scholars in the country to discuss the constitutional issues of the week. We just talked about network neutrality and about the masterpiece Cake Case. And you got to download those podcasts and listen to them. And then we've got to put all this material online and bring it across America so that I can stop vamping and give you the <laughs> results of the debate. Thank you so much, Kate. It is, I, I, before I tell you the results, it's so meaningful to be here in this temple of reason. I mean, Harlan has created a reconstruction of reason debate at its core. And we've just been discussing the most contentious issue in America. There are students who are supporting violence on both sides of this debate. We saw what happened in Charlottesville on both sides. And here we have a temple of reason where both sides are talking about the Constitution and giving you, the people, a chance to make up your own minds. So now I am able to share with you the thrilling results of this debate. Before the debate, 90% of you voted for the motion. That is, you agreed that the First Amendment protects hate speech. And 10% voted against the motion. After the debate, I'm thrilled to report that 85% of you voted for the motion and 15% of you voted against the motion, which means 
Since the winner is the side that changes the most minds, Shannon has had a 5% ch change. Please join me in congratulating Shannon Gilreath. And there was another crucial uh, question, and that was uh, whose minds were open? 85% of you said, yes, you now better understand the opposing view, and only 15% said no. Oddly, that exactly tracks the final <laughs> numbers for the last question, but I'm not gonna st delve into that statistics. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm gonna end just because I have a party trick. I wrote a book about Louis Brandeis, and he wrote the beautiful decision about free speech that we've been debating. So now that the debates are in, I'm just gonna send you into the night by uh, recalling Brandeis's inspiring words in the Whitney case. Those who won our revolution believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. They believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth, that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good job.